Uh, good morning. So I would uh, first like to thank the organizer for uh, inviting me here uh, to this beautiful place. Uh, it's a pleasure here. Uh, so uh, first, I want to give you a short disclaimer. Uh, I will give a half of the title. My lecture will have just half of the title that was announced in the program. So, uh, and the other half will be kind of part of a seminar tomorrow. So. Uh, for the lecture course, I decided to give a uh, um, course on solvable models on quantum anybody chaos. I think it's a kind of uh, interesting. Uh, recent topic that uh, came out of uh, research recently. So, uh, uh, so there will be, I mean, I'll spend like two, two lectures on this. And uh, first, I try to motivate. I mean, OK, first, I try to give you some sort of uh, short overview of my lecture, so short menu. <coughs> so basically, <coughs> I, will, I will discuss uh, 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 before giving you the menu, I will just discuss, uh, I will just give you the, 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 the simple uh, question which motivates, at least to me, this type of research. Motivating question. <coughs> I mean, uh, anyone who grew up in this uh, non-equilibrium dynamics field, I mean, uh, basically, there is uh, kind of a, 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 a toolbox of uh, <clears throat> kind of uh, a, a method or, um, uh, of 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 um, parameters. I mean, uh, <clears throat> which came from 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 from. I mean, comparing let's say uh, 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 statistical properties of quantum systems to random matrix theory. So, uh, and here comes the question: uh, Why does random matrix theory? I mean, my talk is not about random matrix theory, but I'm going to use random matrix theory. Why does random matrix theory work so well? So well in describing <coughs> systems of simple man, <coughs> sorry, spectra of simple many body systems. Systems such as spin one half chains. Chains, even with local interactions. So, I mean, <clears throat> This is maybe the question that the younger of you does not amaze so much because you grew up with this, with this kind of idea that uh, non-integrable systems should be described by random matrix theory. But I, I think, to me, this is a very deep question which kind of was never appropriately addressed. Uh, not in this community, not in community of quantum chaos. There was kind of a, a very active field of research in the 80s, 90s. Particularly because then people were interested really in single particle chaos and systems which have classical limit. Uh, there, basically, people came up with the explanation of this question. So there, this question gave birth to a conjecture uh, for semi-classical systems. We have this Bohigas, Janoni, Schmidt conjecture which says classical chaos chaos means random matrix theory right? roughly very simple words yeah now there is no classical chaos here because when you have non-integrable spin chains there is no classical limit there's h bar is equal to 1 
So there is no small parameter. <coughs> there might be no small parameters. There, might, there, might, there may be small parameters. I mean, there are, I mean, there are sort of perturbative ideas where, uh, you know, which are kind of easier and to, which sometimes work, but sometimes there are no small parameters. At least it looks like there is no small parameters. And the question is, how can you explain that these models, uh, let's say, of spin chains, which have uh, even local interactions. I mean, I will guess, again, local interactions are harder. And as you will see in my lecture, I will give you two examples, basically, two simple textbook examples. I mean, not yet textbook, but they are simple examples. Uh, one with long range and one in short range interactions. You will see that the short range is even more interesting, harder. So, at the end, again, more interesting. So, uh, <clears throat> but still, uh, yeah, so question is, I mean, how does this, how does this work? Because, you know, Again, as I say, I mean, I will not give you, I mean, I, I assume that everyone has heard of random matrix theory and some very basics of it. I will not use, I will, as, much as, I will, in as much as I will use it, I will introduce it, but uh, it's not the point here. You know, and I mean, what is it about? But here, I mean, the, the, again, the amazed, I mean, you should be amazed by this question. I mean, hope that, you know, when you have Hamiltonians of local interacting spin chains, spin one half, which means these Hamiltonians are hugely sparse matrices, uh, there might be even no disorder there. There might be just some parameters, one, two different parameters, uh, and now, now you know you have this spin chain, which is where each spin is, is only to seeing its neighbors. Means that in this huge Hamiltonian matrix, which has two to the l elements in each column, there are only four elements which are non-zero, right? Because you know if there are two body interactions, it's like four by four matrix tensor identity. So these guys are just uh, <coughs> hugely sparse. Yeah. And now you say, okay, now if I diagonalize this matrix. Now you have uh, correlations among levels, which are the same as correlations among levels when you diagonalize a full Gaussian random matrix. Right? So that's, that's, I mean, I hope, I mean, if there is any complaint on this amaze, ama uh, amazement, I mean, please uh, uh, ask, because, you know, that's, I think you should be amazed by this question. Okay, okay so now, <clears throat> before I start, let me now just give you a short menu of my, my mini course. First, I will introduce the key object that we will discuss, that is a spectral form factor. Which will be for us the main signature of chaos. Was, uh, or uh, random matrix theory. <coughs> Second, uh, we will derive, then we will try to answer this question by just deriving uh, a spectral form factor and comparing to random matrix theory for some generic model of long range spin chain. For uh, <clears throat> long range. It's been chain. <clears throat> Three <clears throat> will be a proof. I mean, this will be kind of heuristic, yeah? So there will be, mo I mean, <clears throat> part of my lectures will be kind of giving you the main heuristics, uh, which is not rigorous. But then I'll try to outline a simple part. I mean, one part, which is probably the most interesting, is the one where we can actually give a simple proof. Well, not so simple, but a proof. At least the idea is simple, but then the technicalities could be kind of at least at the moment, are still kind of complicated, but there is a proof of <coughs> random matrix spectral form factor for kicked short ranged or short ranged in chain. I mean, the model is the model that has been mentioned here a couple of times. Even yesterday, I, th I think uh, it's a kicked easing model. So it's a model which is these days getting more popular. Because it's kind of minimal model, which is not integrable uh, <clears throat> of local interacting spin chain. So, I mean, in this in this in these lectures, I will discuss models which I call kicked, which are in the general setting of Floquet systems, uh, which are kind of nice to discuss theoretically because they are discrete in time. Uh, so the time evolution operator is uh, is easier to get. It's just an exponential of two generators, product of exponentials of two generators, which are easy to compute. Uh, <coughs> hopefully, they are generic models. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> the, not, it's not the point of these lectures to discuss Floquet systems or anything of Floquet theory. The idea is to use Floquet systems is just to get a simplest minimalistic models. 
And then if the time permits, which I kind of doubt, so it depends really, but probably I'm going to just give uh, last few minutes on discussing a more general setup. I mean, there will be kind of a key, you know, you know as you will see in this proof, there will be a key, key, key kind of property emerging for this type of models, which is needed to get through the proof, yeah? And this property is what I will later phrase a dual unitarity. I probably have time just to introduce this property and to tell you in words what it means. But uh, <coughs> that, that's all of the outline. OK, uh, <coughs> right. So now let me start. So I don't know. I mean, maybe I, get, I got through this introduction maybe too quick, but maybe I'll get remarks later, but uh, <coughs> I mean, again, this, this measure of uh, spectral correlations, which is called spectral form factor, is getting increasingly popular these days. I mean, also because, you know, it's, there, are, there are different uh, kind of uh, sub-communities in quantum many-body chaos. I mean, many, quantum many-body chaos is, again, a, I mean, you know, this is sociology of physics. I mean, fields are dying and growing and so on, but this field is basically, I mean, quantum chaos is essentially died. Uh, the way it was in the 80s and 90s, and now it's kind of re-emerging as, as a new kind of field, which is making more concentrated on many body systems. And the reason why it's kind of growing now is because there was a push from, let's say, high energy physics. And um, <clears throat> again, there were questions related to holograph holographic models of black holes, which kind of uh, brought up some models which are, again, close to these discussions. Uh, but, uh, <clears throat> and also the measures that people discuss and propose there, I mean, uh, they are basically this measure, measure. So, I mean, uh, it's kind of, uh, I mean, okay, I mean, this measure, of course, has been, is, as you will see, I mean, it's kind of the, the, the simplest measure of spectral correlation. So, it's probably the, 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 the should be the, the first measure that, that theoretical physicists should touch. Even though people who use mainly numerics uh, are used to other measures, for example, like level spacings or number variance or spectral stiffness uh, and so on. Uh, which are kind of easier to kind of uh, represent numerically, but for they are theoretically, at least the level spacing is theoretically much harder because it's not a pure point measure. So uh, I will try to advocate now that spectral form factor is kind of easier uh, and uh, it's not so different. I mean, it has the, all the information that it's, I mean, it has most of information that it's in level spacings. So, I mean, you can deduce spectral correlations, you can deduce spectral level repulsion, you can deduce in particular spectral stiffness, spectral form factor. So, uh, so let's first discuss a bit uh, uh, a spectral form factor, and uh, we will right away discuss it in the context of, of, of uh, Floquet systems, and uh, therefore in the context of circular ensemble of unitary, unitary matrix. So I mean, the idea is now to take a, a unitary matrix, which gives you the time evolution, right? The time evolution is... This unitary matrix to power t in some initial state. <clears throat> so far, I'm not, I mean, this is just abstract now, so just take some unitary matrix. I will see, you will see that later, I mean, I will discuss some particular models where this is a Floquet, I mean, this is a one step propagator of a Floquet system. But within random matrix theory, this could be just, a, you know, a, a random matrix with a Hall measure. And uh, question now. Uh, <clears throat> so, I mean, uh, since we will discuss spectral correlations, which should just define a spectrum now. <clears throat> so now these are the eigenstates and eigenvalues. So now this is a spectrum. Let me call curly n the number of the dimension of the matrix. Little n will denote the, the run over eigenvalues. And these eigenvalues <coughs> are numbers on a unit circle. So now the spectrum basically is a subset of a unit circle, a discrete subset of a unit circle. So that's nice actually because it's like a, you are, we are now confined in a box of, of circumference of two pi with periodic boundaries. Uh, so there's no boundaries. The system is periodic. Uh, so, I mean, <clears throat> that's one of the reasons why I personally like, you know, uh, circular ensembles much more than Gaussian ensembles, 
uh, because there is basically the full democracy in the spectrum. So there is nothing that depends on energy, or quasi-energy in this case. Uh, so there is one parameter less to average over. So that's, I mean, <clears throat> that's just, again, one, one reason why this could be kind of looked at first as a minimal model. Then maybe we should look at static systems. At the end of the day, I mean, <clears throat> some of these results could be translated to static systems by simply doing, doing the Trotter formula. So maybe this is, this is the next step that <clears throat> one, one can do. But let's just discuss now emergence of random matrices in blockage systems as a, as a kind of a... Okay, so now... <clears throat> uh, so we have now a spectrum. Now let's try to... I mean, now think of this spectrum as a gas in, in a box in 1D. So now it's a simple... Kind of, I mean, again, this was mentioned yesterday already. I mean, you see this is kind of a log gas in, in, on a box. Uh, in random matrix theory and uh, in some particular dynamical system is a set of points, uh, and we'd like, to we'd like to just consider it, this set of points as a gas and try to define its correlation properties. And of course, now there are two things. I mean, the first uh, thing that you define is a density, is a one-point function. Row of phi. Just a, well, the way I will define, the way I will normalize it, I will normalize it so that it has uni, uh, uh, average unity, so two pi over curly n, and then sum over delta spikes located at the positions of the eigenvalues. <clears throat> so that would be kind of a microscopic one point function density. <clears throat> now the average, and I will just by angle brackets, I will denote the average over spectrum, <clears throat> so uh, that will be 1 over 2 pi. Phi, this will be a spectral average over <coughs> rho phi, and this will be 1. <coughs> Just n, uh, 1 over 2 pi, 1, where it's defined. Now let's define a two-point function. <coughs> Will be the uh, 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 two point uh, you want uh, density, density correlation function or uh, <coughs> a two point function. So, say I will take uh, distance between eigenvalues theta and I will look at the density at rho phi plus theta over 2, rho phi minus theta over 2, minus the connected part, which is in this case. Want, I can do. Both equal to one. <coughs> right. <coughs> that is the definition of two point function, vector correlation function, <coughs> air correlation function, gas. And now uh, we could study this object. But uh, it turns out that it's much more convenient to do the equivalent object, to compute the equivalent object, which is just the Fourier transform. Uh, the spectral form factor is defined as a Fourier transform of R of theta. So <coughs> I will denote it as K of t, a Fourier variable. So now theta is a cyclic variable on from 0 to 2 pi, basically a function on a circle. And, uh, uh, the Fourier transform is a function on, in, on an integer lattice, right? I mean, it's simple a Fourier. Fourier analysis, so it's a function of the discrete lattice, so t is discrete, t is an integer. <laughs> it also has a meaning of time, right? I mean, now in this case, time is an integer because I can only propagate our uh, integer multiple of elementary time steps. <clears throat> K of t is, uh, is uh, I will leave some space here to define a property normalization. 0 to 2 pi, uh, d theta, r of theta, e to the i theta t. <clears throat> and here I will just put n square over 2 pi. It's a convenient normalization I can choose. I mean, it's probably not the most common one, but I will see it's convenient. So, and uh, the, the overall normalization factor doesn't really matter. So now let's just do now a simple uh, calculation. <clears throat> So now I'll just plug this, uh, plug this in. Uh, <clears throat> so 
now this means this sum, this, this, this bracket means this, I have to average this over the location of the center, phi, so, uh, phi d phi, <clears throat> and then uh, there is double sum, so they, then each row is given as a sum. The delta spikes, <clears throat> first of all, there is two pi over n square, two pi square is a square of this e factor, and then there is n, then there is sum over n and n prime, let's say, double sum. Uh, <coughs> not yet, so it's like a, a of two deltas, phi minus phi n, <coughs> sorry, not phi, but phi plus theta over two minus phi n, delta phi minus theta over two minus phi n prime. Now we'll, okay, so now that's it, and then there is, uh, and there is also this part one, right? This, and there is to the i theta. Okay. <coughs> so now, <coughs> Now we'll introduce new variables here. Uh, let's call it phi one and phi two. Now I integrate over theta and phi over between zero and two pi, and then there is this simple transformation to the center of mass and the difference uh, coordinate, right? And the Jacobian of this transformation is equal to one. So I can end up. Uh, uh, if this is on a 2D, two, two torus, if fine theta run over two torus, then phi one, phi two also run over two torus. So then uh, <coughs> I can replace this. Okay, uh, sum over d phi one, uh, the integral from phi from zero to two phi, d phi two. <coughs> uh, phi square over n square. Uh, Uh, <clears throat> now we see this uh, one, ah, not very good notation, let's call it phi one tilde, so it doesn't make this matter, tilde minus phi n, <clears throat> phi two tilde minus phi n prime, okay, and uh, one, Okay, um, now these two, both of these two integrals are, uh, of course, theta now is, theta now is, uh, theta, theta is, uh, is phi one tilde minus phi two, right? <coughs> so this is phi one tilde minus phi two tilde. <coughs> So now these two first, this product of this, this uh, double integral factorizes, right? Uh, I can put this, this guy uh, the first integral and this second guy to the second integral. And uh, both of these integrals are trivial, right? <coughs> so then for the first integral, I still have sum over n. But now this, 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 this guy picks integrand to have value phi n. This is e to the i phi n. Uh, forgot about t here, phi n t. And the second integral is e to the minus i phi n prime t. Yeah. And then there is this one. And this one, uh, <coughs> this one just gives me the, uh, again, the product of two guys. Uh, uh, which are zero unless t is equal to zero. So this is just uh, 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 delta equal to zero. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and uh, okay. Uh, so there was one two pi which is missing. Uh, Epsi, one two pi. Uh, yes, when I define this average over pi, I would have to divide two pi here, right? I mean, this was the average over phi, so pi. 
one to pi, which is out here. So there is this, this guy exactly cancels. So what I get now is the basically, <clears throat> and this is just a trace, right? This is just a trace of u to the t, and this is trace of u to the minus t. So what I get now is trace of u to the t, is trace of u to the minus t minus, uh, minus uh, again, Here, here, this was delta, <coughs> was delta t comma zero times two pi, right? Because hmm. was. Uh, This is integral over theta, uh, this is integral over theta, which is two pi, and this is pi cancel square here. This is n square, that delta t. Okay, so now what we have found, I mean, I'm sorry for this slightly messy calculation, but it's super elementary, that's why I decided to do it. Otherwise, I could just quote the result. Nice to see that this is something that is totally elementary. So uh, as a result, spectral form factor is simply trace of u to the t modulus square, because this is just a complex conjugate of this guy, minus the connective part, which is where there is this delta spike at t equals zero, which is canceled by the second term. The rest is just a trace of u to the t. But this is trace of identity, right? When t is equal to zero, this is trace of identity. This is n square, which is canceled by this. It's just so that k of, t, k of zero is zero. <coughs> Let's remember this formula. That's, that's the first kind of, uh, I mean, not a result, but simply a definition. We want, uh, which we're going to use extensively. Uh, so you see, I mean, <coughs> I mean that's, that's basically nice. No, I mean, we have a super simple measure of spectral correlations, which is kind of straightforwardly connected to dynamics. Yeah? This is a measure of spectral correlations. This is just dynamics, right? I mean, what is trace of u to the t? Basically, starting by a random, from a random state, doing dynamics and computing, if you want, return, prob return amplitude to this same random state. Or if you want, compute return probability. Now, uh, it's not yet quite there, but you know, if you do this and then average over random states, the appropriate invariant measure, then you get exactly the trace. So basically, it's a random return amplitude. And it's also related to random return probability with a little bit of care. So and if you have your ex experimentalist friend and he can you know, measure return amplitude probability to return to the same state, and uh, he can argue that this state is, is a kind of random state, so it's random enough, then basically, this is a directly accessible. I mean, this is like correlation functions. So, uh, so basically, yeah, you have basically just a simple fully transform of spectral correlations, but then it's related to dynamics. It's not something very abstract. It's really down to earth. <laughs> and moreover, I mean, but now there is a caveat here. <clears throat> this is very nice, but it also has a, has a price to pay. So now this, this, this I mean, <clears throat> you see, I mean, more, again, people who do numerics essentially do level spacings, and there is a reason for that. And level spacings are very robust. They are just histograms. They just make a histogram of if you compute this, uh, I'll probably uh, want to show you some slides, but maybe it too, it would be to, to change between slides and board, but maybe I can focus my slides for the end of my lecture. Uh, but you know, I will show you just later some, some pictures of how the spectral form factor look. But the point is, if you just, I can just sketch you how it looks. Uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, if you just uh, use, uh, if you just take some dynamical systems, compute the spectrum, compute this object, right? Then what you get is basically a point which are all over the place. <clears throat> which means spectral form factor does not exist. You just define it like this because it is not, as people in random matrix, people in random matrix theory would say, it's not self-averaging. Not self-averaging. 
is that I have to define some, some, some average, some ensemble average. Exactly, this is for generic chaotic systems. You just compute it, you plot it, you get basically random graph, and then you say, I mean, I have not yet considered any specific uh, system, but just take your, I mean, I will show you some examples, but just the moment you just trust me that this is a bad thing to, to calculate without further care. Averaging or psi. Well, that is, but, uh, well, it's still not, yeah, yeah, you know, but still not. I mean, the way it's defined here is not self-average. <clears throat> Means it just doesn't exist, yeah? You don't do additional averaging. So what people in random matrix theory will do, I mean, they would, of course, average over the ensemble of random matrices, or operate on the matrix ensemble. People in numerics, what they would do, they would, uh, still, uh, they would still compute this, but they had to average over some additional uh, parameter. So then one has to define this spectral form factor. I will, I will write it as k bar, as sort of some sort of ensemble average of the Well, there is a reason, right? I mean, this, this, I mean, you can compute the fluctuation of this quantity, and you see that this fluctuation is finite and doesn't decrease with, uh, with growing the system. It doesn't depend on the system size. So, I mean, yeah, this is something that I wanted to say next. So there are, there are explicit results. For example, for random matrices, there are results that spectral form factor, that the fluctuation, the variance of k, so that is expectation of k square minus expectation of k square is of the same order as expectation of k square. So as as spectral form factor, it does not depend. Does not depend on systems. Here I'm a bit vague on purpose. It's of course in random matrices it's precise. This dynamical systems it is vague. I mean it depends, but you know it's it's a common it's a common experience that in random. I mean. And the reason is the reason is that the dynamical systems, chaotic dynamical systems, follow random matrices not only in the expectation value of this guy, but also in fluctuations of this guy. It, we will. And, uh, we will. We will. But before doing it that, like no, no, we will. But you know, let's first try to see what we, will, we, we what we have to worry about, and the fluctuations of this quantity is one of these things. So we have to define additional averages, otherwise, fluctuates too much. Doesn't, it's not ergodic. I mean, it doesn't have to do the additional averages. <clears throat> so what people in numerics sometimes do is simply what they do is just, you know, <clears throat> in numerics, just either average over some, over parameters of the model, For example, over magnetic field or over spin-spin interactions and so on. It turns out it will be enough. Again, I will show you some pictures. But no. No, I, I confuse you. I confuse you too much. No. Uh, it just means that you have to be careful when, when you compute this quantity because uh, I don't understand you. Well, that is true, but it's true that more than just with respect to the average, that's true with respect to the, 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 so the distribution. No, it's true. I mean, I'm talking about spectral fluctuations. I'm not talking yet about any specific measure of spectral fluctuation. Spectral fluctuations of chaotic, of, let's say, of, of, of local interacting uh, non-integral spin chains will be given by random matrices with respect to some measure of spectral fluctuation. This measure is the form factor which, when it, after it's averaged over additional parameters, which I will define more precisely. But I just now give you the, the caveat. I mean, why, what, what needs to be worried about? I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I hope I can become clearer to your question later. 
But for the moment, just trust me that you have to average over something else, else because things don't make sense. Huh. So I mean, what people will do, and I will show you some slides later, but you know, uh, when you present numerical data, what you have to do is you average over additional parameters in the model. Uh, or even weaker form of averages is that to moving averages over time. Moving averages over time. But that, that actually, that's actually very innocent averages, right? I mean, you will have this, this point all over the place, but then if you just do some convolution with some, 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 some box function, for example, which has width of, I don't know, 100 time steps, you will see smooth curves emerging. <clears throat> and then in the limit n to infinity, you could widen. You see that basically that there is a time scale here, which is called Heisenberg time, which is roughly given by the number of levels. And when this moves to infinity, and when you scale this plot, you see that in the thermodynamic limit, you could define moving time averages such that this thing could exist. So there is no real problem. There is problem for analysis, for numerical analysis. Okay, <clears throat> now, okay, so this was, yeah, one thing. The next thing, before, I go, let's go, before we go to dynamical systems, we should still kind of make a brief uh, 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 <clears throat> reminder of how this spectral form factor looks in the matrix theory. So again, I mean, I will look now here at spectral form factor in circular ensembles, <clears throat> in the so-called Dysons way. <clears throat> so there are basically three elementary random matrix ensembles that people worry about, uh, that they discuss. The simplest one is the unitary ensemble, the circular unitary ensemble, <clears throat> which is essentially equivalent to the unitary group. The Ha measure. So there are, these are now ensembles of random matrices, but of course one has to specify the measure on this set of random matrices, right? And then you can define spectral form factor if you want, simply as an integral over the unitary group with respect to the Ha measure of trace of U T modulus squared. <laughs> And this integral can be computed. I mean, there are different ways how to compute it, but it's uh, easy, not too difficult. And uh, it goes like t, or t less or equal to dimension of the matrix, and then it saturates to n. <clears throat> okay. Stop, so I have to, I want to show, plot some pictures. So sorry to erase this part. <clears throat> So now let's just plot one graph where you plot just the results for random matrices, uh, ensemble averaged spectral form factor. <clears throat> there is a critical time scale which is called Heisenberg time, again, which is just not approximately equal, but exactly equal to the number of levels in this case. You see uh, the way this, this, this object has been scaled, x value, which is equal to the number also n. I don't know, some colors, different colors for different ensembles. <laughs> okay. Uh, the important thing is, okay, this is super nice because the dependency is kind of piecewise linear. And the main thing which you have to work, I mean, which, which you have to stress here now is this uh, spectral correlations are now reflected in the fact that this grows as t. In particular, it is very small for small t. We will compare later with, with kind of uh, integrable systems or random spectra. You'll see that it's completely different. <clears throat> now, there are two other ensembles. Uh, one of them we will use, so it's important to, to mention. There is ensemble of, so this, this basically corresponds to, just to give you the, Short, uh, I mean, this corresponds to, this should correspond to physics for models where, where there is uh, no time reversal symmetry. Doesn't exist a time reversal symmetry. That's a k bar, yeah. I mean, the way I defined it is k bar. Thank you. 
Now, that should be applicable to systems where there is no time reversal, no, no anti-unity. Now, for systems, for, for systems where there is time reversal, yeah. This is true for any M. <clears throat> for, this, for, for this particular case, it's true for any M. For, for other ensembles, these are larger end results. Uh, uh, yeah, but otherwise I will not be super precise here. So, uh, so the next one is the orthogonal ensemble, which is basically uh, can be written as a matrix V, which can be written as a product of unitary and the transpose, where U runs over the unitary group with a half measure. So, but now take uh, sampling u over the unitary with the har, then uh, considering matrices u, u transpose, this runs with the correct measure over the orthogonal ensemble. And um, then this defines the form for spectral form factor. Again, you can, there's an integral over the unitary group. This again can be calculated, but it's not so easy. <coughs> And uh, basically, it goes like 2t minus corrections, t log uh, 1 plus 2t over n, or again, t less than n. So now this is, I think, just n to infinity. These are asymptotic results. 2n t. Minus n, I think. N <coughs> minus n. Larger. So basically, what happens now is <coughs> uh, you have uh, something which goes with the larger slope, two t, and it curves. Goes again asymptotically to one. Hmm. Hmm. Then the, okay, so that this should correspond to dynamical systems where there exists anti-unitary symmetry, which squares to one. There is, uh, let's say, time reversal symmetry, which is usually associated to complex conjugation in some basis, and complex conjugation squares to one. If you do it twice, you do nothing. So if it's simple complex conjugation, then this, the, 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 your model should be in the orthogonal class. Then there is a third class, <coughs> which I'm not going to use at all. I mean, I'm mentioning only these ones, so I will do it super quickly. So there is uh, the so-called symplectic ensemble, CSC, where, symplectic mat where the matrix can be written, again, matrix of this ensemble. But <coughs> it's a member of this ensemble, right? Is the same yeah, but member of this ensemble, and uh, <coughs> this can be written as u u times r u u r with this u where the u r is some sort of symplectic transpose, which is given as j u transpose j minus one, where j is the symplectic unit. <coughs> uh, u runs over the unitary with dimension two n. And now the only thing I will stress now is that uh, for short times, k, of, k bar of t now goes like, k bar of t now goes like t over 2, times much less than n. <coughs> now it goes with a half of slope. Color. <coughs> But then what is, what is funny, I will, you will see that if I wrote the formula, but I don't, didn't, so, but what is kind of funny here is that when you approach the Heisenberg time, it develops a log singularity. Very innocent singularity, but still. And then it again plateaus to the value, which is symptotically equal just to n. 
<clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so now, why, why, what is this? Why is this so special? I mean, <clears throat> now I space. <clears throat> <coughs> question is, what is so special about this asymptotic value? <coughs> well, that is a value which is given by random spectra. So now if you just think of, again, what, what are we doing? What are we calculating? If you take a random spectrum, So just consider points on a unit circle which are random, IID, uniform between 0 and 2 pi. Then you can define, again, with respect to that measure, you can define uh, a, a, an averaged spectral form factor, which I will just write it now as a double sum, n on n prime, from 1 to n, e to the i phi n minus phi n prime, times t. <clears throat> right? Uh, now you see, I mean, uh, 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 how does this look? I mean, uh, this will be zero for n different from n prime, right? Because these are ID random from zero to two pi. So it will be only non-zero when n is equal to n prime. But then it is equal to, uh, n is equal to one, right? And there are n such terms, so that's always equal to curly n. So for IID random spectrum with no correlations, that's equal to n, and it's independent of time. <clears throat> so that is, <clears throat> if you want, that's a Poisson ensemble. Sometimes people call this Poisson ensemble or Poisson random. And that, according to the Perry Tabor conjecture, that should correspond to integral system. Okay, I, I had this box here, but then there is another conjecture, which is called Barry Tabor conjecture. It says that uh, integrable systems have a spectrum which is given by <coughs> Poissonian random eigenvalues that is Poissonian sum. Uh, <clears throat> that is actually, I mean, I'm not aware of any good proofs or any good, you know, any good rigorous results on this, on this, on this very tower conject. So that's really very heuristic. I mean, after, you know, this was done, this was proposed even before Buhiga's conjecture. It was 1977. I mean, there are very kind of uh, heuristic, nice heuristics about this, which I could tell about, which I could tell you about, but I'm not, because, you know, spent more time on chaotic systems, but... Uh, there is a, still, I think, there are interesting problems around, you know, mathematical physics of this problem. I mean, there, are, there, are, there are very specific results for very specific integral models, like uh, spectra of Laplacians on, 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 on rectangles, for example, of rectangular drums, uh, sounds of I mean, spectra of rectangular drums. I mean, for that, people have been able to analyze a lot and, uh, you know, develop beautiful mathematics around this. But for general, general let's say, take, take a better, better ansatz integral system that, that we all have about. Uh, I have no idea how to approach this. Actually, it's not so clear why Berry Tabor should work for better answers in systems because you know, better equations are kind of coupled equations, and um, it's not clear how this goes. That's exactly what I'm going to do now. You will see. That's actually a super nice question, yeah, which actually was given by Wojciech. I had some. Then I did this exercise. It's like an exercise that I'm going to do to you now because it's like five minutes. We can co compute spectral form factor for random, random non-interacting spins. You will see that exactly you reproduce. <clears throat> right. It's a kind of the cleaner, cleaner measure for level correlations because it's a pure two-point function. Uh, well, I mean, it's a kind of a general kind of wake conjecture saying that if you have an integral system, you should 
model your spectra as a random Poisson, right? And from that, you derive either spectral form factor or level spacing or stiffness. Want, but it's the, it tells you about the, let's say, joint distribution. I mean, it will tell you that this is a log gas with beta equal to zero. It means log gas with no log correlation, no correlations at all. <coughs> That's, that's, that, that, I mean, that's true, would not, no, no, that would not play. I mean, it's, it's a, that would be not, not enough. I mean, uh, spectral form factor is just a two-point two point measure. I mean, you could think of in, in devising uh, uh, wicked uh, spectral sequences for which two-point measures would be plus one, but higher point measures would deviate from one. I mean, I, I'm not aware of examples now, but I think it would, this could be easy. I mean, now this is just a statement about two-point measure. So two-point two -point spectral correlations still don't imply that this is the subset of, of, of correlation functions. <coughs> okay, but now let's do this super simple example, which I think is quite pedagogical. <coughs> let's try to think of a random spins in, or in non-interacting spins in the random magnetic field, or if you want, Let's think of an L-bit Hamiltonian after you go into the MBL regime. Let's see what happens to the spectral correlations. <coughs> spectral form factor. <coughs> no. Hit the pick. Uh, let's discuss spectral form factor in spin chains in general. First, let's make an example. <clears throat> Not interacting random spins. So I say non interacting spins in random field. So let's say we take a Hamiltonian, which is just Hj, 1 to L. Uh, now, we have, now, our, now we have a spin one half chain, so now our Hilbert space dimension is 2 to the L. <coughs> now we have basically, we spend this space by Pauli matrices, by tensor products of Pauli matrices. Now let's take sigma z, take a z field. And now let's take this Hj to be <coughs> Iid random 0 to pi. Now let's take a strong random field so to, to make. I mean, actually, my result, if you think of it in thermodynamic limit, it doesn't really depend on the distribution of this magnetic field. But to, makes, uh, to make this uh, calculation simple, let's now just Take, uh, and now let's, I mean, our time now could not be integer, could be continuous, but to make life simple, let's now just consider still inter. So let's now think of this as a Floquet system for some reason. I mean, let's just take, take a stroboscopic map, so time still integer, okay? So now u is now e to the minus i th, okay? But since these are independent spins, this is the basically now like u1, uh1 tensor, uh2 tensor, uh last one. And by UH, I mean simple uh, two by two matrix, <clears throat> right? Is this two by two matrix, which is e to the minus i h plus i h zero zero is diagonal matrix with entries which are exponentials of the field. <clears throat> so everything is super simple, right? And now let's define the spectral form factor. Now what, what's clear what we will average over now, we'll average over random field. So this will be our uh, averaging parameter. So now let's define k bar. <laughs> so 
Let's now define a vector of random fields. Find this as a spectral averaging with respect to IID random fields. Okay, so now this is just a pure algebra. It's a few lines of algebra. <coughs> I define this trace, trace of a product. You can define a trace of a ten, uh, the trace of a tensor product, right? Let's write this as a u star to power t. By star, I mean now just complex conjugation in Pauli basis. This like this. Uh, Right, but now you see. I mean, this is like uh, now I can do. Uh, I can do now. Um, if you want um, this, I don't want to frighten you here, but you know, you can just expand this trace into multiple tensor products, right? I mean, this guy is again a tensor product. Now I organize my my, my tensor product such that I put her first u h one tensor u star h one. And then I put u h2 tensor u star h2, and so on. So I've organized my tensor product such that first I take first spin and it's, and it's copy, second spin and it's copy. So it's like a spin chain and it's copy, but I put copy to each spin. So and then I do this 12, 12 times. So it's like a 12 fold tensor product, I mean tensor product, right? And then trace over it. Uh, uh, um. Now, again, use this, 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 this formula above, but now in the reverse direction. Now, this is a trace of a tensor product, but this is now a product of traces. Yeah? Over H1. But now these are ID variables, so I can do now averages independently. So now this is basically just a simple average over a single variable from zero to two pi, or this trace of a four by four matrix, and then to power L. Now this we can compute. I mean, this is like, okay, so it's this, okay? Now I have to do the tensor product of two such matrices. It's again a diagonal matrix, and then the trace of it. So, Again, okay, do it slowly. It's trace for this guy. Now this is like, uh, so that is uh, something like one e to the two ih e to the minus two ih one diagonal, right? Power L. Now there is a trace with expectation value h two plus two times cosine, two plus two times cosine h. Uh, to power L, but now I average, average of the cosine is zero, so it's two to the L, so it's equal to N for any T. And of course, you're in trouble, yeah. Right. Yes. But you see, integrable systems are very kind of fragile structures, yeah. And uh, it's known since, again, since Berry and uh, discussions in the 80s that uh, harmonic oscillators are not uh, nice examples of integral systems because, in fact, I speak at fence. It's as far as, you, as, as possible from Poisson, yeah? We should avoid harmonic oscillators. We should avoid equidistant uh, picket fence spectra. But again, I mean, yeah. Which, which examples? Yeah. yeah, okay, so I mean, just to recapitulate, I mean, the integral systems are a very tricky business, yeah? I mean, also with respect, or in particular with respect to spectral correlations, so. Okay, so, but I, I, I had some reason why I gave this example, right? I mean, because uh, as a kind of teaser, I wanted to use this measure to detect many body localization. 
So you see, I mean, uh, this would be now kind of saying quite clearly that MBL should be characterized by not only Poisson spectrum, should be characterized by flat spectral form factor. Kind of more precise statement. <clears throat> yes. Well, ah, ah, no, good, yeah. The time argument was, was everywhere, but uh, kind of was completely irrelevant. So it was already here. So every, all, everywhere with the T was the time arguments. Thank you, thank you. So please excuse me for that, but then, yeah, correct. The end is here. So it's here. But then, of course, for any T which is non-zero, T has to be non-zero. For T0, you have this delta, which is strand N square, subtracted by the connection. <clears throat> okay, good. So now we are ready for sort of for more non-trivial examples. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It's more interesting to, to think. Uh, I, I'm, I, exp I surely expect the same thing to hold. And actually, I'm going now to use an example which will be kind of the other extreme case, but I have all the terms. For that, it's again trivial that it should hold. But now, if you have just few terms or you have this quasi local, uh, then one has to rethink about this. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, now let's say, now let's take uh, a second example kick teasing model. But first, we'll discuss long range. <clears throat> yeah, sure, sure. No, I think it's true. I mean, uh, the only thing you need is that. Uh, yes, exactly. Yes. Right. Right, but uh, right, but you see, I mean, I have this. You have this h times t. So basically, what you need for large time, then you have to consider large time. So for short time, you're right. But then for sufficiently large time, basically, what you only need is, is the, the properties of distribution around h equal to. That is asymptotic. That is uh, locally, it's always flat. So I think this will be always zero. Large t. Expectation value of cos and h times t will be close to zero. Oh, yeah, I mean, we can discuss this. Uh... Yes. But now we have this, some distribution, some, some, some continuous distribution of h, locally flat around h equal to zero, let's assume. Now we look at distribution of cos of h times t. This, this will really... yes. yes. No, I mean, I, I'm sorry. I mean, I wanted to give you a kind of a clean example, and then, as you pointed out, I mean, immediately make some of the assumptions as clean as and they pointed out. I mean, in integral systems, there are a lot of things. Let's just not get too excited about integral systems. <clears throat> okay. So now let's define a class of models which we could discuss as an example of chaotic systems or non-integral systems for which we would expect a random matrix spectral form factor to hold. So again, all these will be a flow kicker type system. So the Hamiltonian will be time dependent. So let's say the Hamiltonian will be written in this way that it's a pro it's a sum to terms. I mean, nowadays most of people would like to define this as a two time step protocol, so half a time step. I would use Hamiltonian HI. Other half a time step, I would use Hamiltonian, which I called H kick. But since I grew up in this uh, quantum standard map, Chirico standard map uh, kind of field, you know, people there prefer to think of it as a pulse system. Yeah, but it's again exactly the same thing, where you just take uh, most of the time this Hamiltonian and at some instantaneous, short but strong pulses. I mean, the pulses which last for a short time, but they are very strong. You take this Hamiltonian. 
Yeah? And then this is called then a kicked model. Yeah? A kicked. <coughs> Now, easing, I mean, the first part, as I said, will be an easing Hamiltonian, but I will now put uh, everything, you know, which is, has to do with interactions among these spins. Uh, so, uh, uh, first there will be a magnetic field. Then there will be a two-spin interaction. Then possibly there will be a three spin interaction. So this will be some te interaction tensors, which will have two, three, and so on indices. <coughs> we we'll call this one J, I will call this one J prime. <coughs> And then, I mean, my point here will be that the structure of this uh, diagonal, you see, this will be kind of diagonal because obviously I will use the sigma z eigenbasis. So the part of the, 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 the structure of the diagonal part of the evolution operator is not so important as long as, as, long as it produces some sort of pseudo-randomness. Then there is the second part, which is kind of mostly the most orthogonal as it can be to this diagonal part, which is the off-diagonal kick, which will be just the transverse field. And to make life simple, I will take homogeneous transverse field with the same amplitude I call B. Now this will be not, sorry for, now this, I will write this not as a curly N, sorry, this will be now a Roman N. Uh, I should probably use Roman L. For some reason I keep using Roman N here. But that's now, now this is a number of spins, so the dimension of the Hilbert space is equal to the Roman. Okay, so now, you see, I mean, uh, writing a Floki operator, one time step evolution operator, is now just a product of two terms, which I will denote as WV, where W is uh, e to the minus i uh, h ising, and V is e to the minus i h kick. But now it depends where do you define the reference time, just after or just before the kick, I mean, here we define it just, uh, so we start with V, which is the kick, so we define it, define it just before the kick, then we do the kick, and then the free evolution, the easing evolution, and so on. <clears throat> okay, so now, uh, so now what is the time evolution? Now it's U to the T, and it's a, it's a sequence of, of kicks and free evolution. <laughs> okay, so now, uh, why is this kind of simple model? Well, this model is kind of simple because it has this clean, but a kind of minimal structure. I mean, one part of the Hamiltonian is diagonal, and the other one is kind of also simple. It's off diagonal, but you know, it's, it has some similarity, let's say, with a standard map, which is also simple in two bases. Now, this one is simple in computational bases and very simple in the orthogonal base. HK doesn't commute with HI. Right, uh, exactly, that's why I, okay, yeah, maybe I should have really done this, but that's why, I mean, this is a time-dependent Hamiltonian, right? So what I do is basically I write U as a time-ordered product, time-ordered exponential. Now I start from, from just before the kick I said, so from zero minus to one minus, yeah? H, okay, I do this. I do this carefully, and first, since I start from zero minus, I start with this guy, but now this is a delta. Now I just regularize my delta by something which has width epsilon and height one over epsilon. So now, in the interval of duration epsilon, I have pick up just this term, and I can neglect this guy. So I get e to the minus ihk, which is v. And then for the rest of the interval, I have a constant static Hamiltonian for time of duration one, is hi, and I get e to the uh, e to the e to the minus i h i. Yeah. Right. So now, as I say, I mean this will be the same as the two time step protocol, where you have half a time step with constant static Hamiltonian h kick, and the other one h i. Then I get the same. 
They don't commute, that's important. Otherwise, we get a trivial model. And uh, the kicking is because is in order to make to, to, to make the production of time evolution operator very simple. You have to use it any. <clears throat> okay, good. So now, for example, I mean there there, you know, this is like a again. I mean, what I will now use for the rest of this, uh, I was hoping to finish this today, so I'll still try to do it. But what I'm now hoping to, I mean, what I will now assume is that this uh, tensors, well, now this is just random longitudinal field, the two particle interaction, three particle interaction, so on. I will now use this, to, I will now assume that these are random numbers, yeah? This will be just, if you want, another random mo model. I mean, we call this random face model because this is just a face, yeah? But I will argue that this model sort of should work very well for simple non-random models for which this uh, uh, easing energy, which is since it's extensive, and what is important here is just easing energy mod 2 pi. So if easing energy is complex, complex is a binary function of, of easing uh, variables, but if it's a complicated enough binary function, then it could, you could think of it as a pseudo-random function. So there is an assumption of pseudo-randomness, which Maybe under some specific circumstance one can prove, but uh, we will just verify that it works well under some circumstances. And, uh, you know, I will argue maybe, maybe I'll start tomorrow's lecture by slides because I will just try to solve this model for you. Then I'll show, show you how it works. <clears throat> okay, so now just an example, which I will use. It will be just, uh, for example, take uh, easing Hamiltonian, which is <clears throat> long ranged, it's some, magnetic, some, some long range interaction. J prime minus J to some power alpha plus J and one on field. P J J to power alpha. Then this N one are one over J to power alpha to minus one two so-called cuts normalization for long-ranged models and j prime one over j prime minus alpha one so for some values of this coupling constant j uh, so that, uh, that here there is another constant which I call h so there are two coupling constants j h and uh, pa, uh, some exponent alpha right so this model for alpha less than one I mean, it's a kind of effectively mean field. Field. For alpha larger than two, it is effectively short ranged. For alpha between one and two, it is interesting. Well, it is interesting in either case, but for us, it is interesting between, for alpha for between one and two. So for alphas between, in the range between alpha, between one and two, it will serve our purpose. It will actually produce pseudo-random sequence of, of, of diagonal energies. So that is just as a, now let's just, uh, <clears throat> just to keep in mind that there are some maybe simple models, simple enough models, which can be very well captured by this. So now let's just set up the calculation of spectral form factor for this. For this, what we call random phase model, yeah? <clears throat> so first we start, we start with expanding trace of u to the t. I mean, that's the main thing. I mean, the main thing is if you, I mean, is to come up with a scheme how to write trace of Evolution propagator, right? In discrete time. So this is, as I said already, this is just a product, multiple product of V times W. Well, now this is a very, very similar thing. It's like a textbook a calculation, which is basically the first lines of deriving path integral representation of the propagator. But now we don't do any continuum time limit. So we just do really strictly discreetly. So we take 
finite number of decompositions of identity. So now, first, we use, again, forgot to say that, but we use now computational basis. That is sigma z basis. Where these spin variables are plus minus one. Sigma z j are eigenstates eigenvalue sj of this guy. So uh, if I apply this piece of the evolution operator for diagonal, the, the one which is generated by this Hamiltonian, this is just a phase. Just gives you a phase. And this phase is again is a if you want a classical binary function of multiple spins, uh, is again the same representation. Um, Hmm. Right, so it's a classical energy of classical one this easing model, <coughs> um, possibly multi speed interactions. And then, uh, what about the other part of the Hamiltonian, the other, um, the other part of the evolution operator? Well, the other part of the evolution operator is also super simple because it's a sum of terms which commute, which means that it's exponential is a, is a tensor product. Yeah? So uh, e to the so e to the i um, to the iv in this basis is uh, sorry uh, v. So e to the minus so v is e to the minus i uh, h kick in this basis is 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 equal to uh, cosine b i minus i sine b minus i sine b cosine b the tensor product. <laughs> which means this is also very simple, which means that if I take a matrix element of v between two sets, between, between two classical spin configurations, uh, then this will be just a pure product, yeah? We just let's call it little v, sj, sj prime, sorry, s prime, j, j running from one to n. Zero, z, v, v plus plus is equal to v minus minus is cosine b, v plus minus is equal to v minus plus is minus i sine b. <sighs> okay. And now, see, now with what we do is just. Uh, a very straightforward calculation, so probably I should I could do it quickly. So what I do now is just take a, 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 a multiple insertion of identity where I just name these spin configurations S1, S2, ST, right? So what I do now is here insert um, like this, here insert I'm like this, and so on. <laughs> okay, uh, right, so what I get now is, is, is uh, and since this is diagonal in this basis, I only pick up the face, <clears throat> so it's like e to the minus, uh, minus i uh, s1, uh, v s1, s2, this is the matrix element, s prime. <laughs> e to the minus i eta s2. And by underline, I mean, I mean kind of vectors, multi-indices, right? Component. This is s2, s3, and so on. <coughs> um, and is e to the minus i theta s t, and then it's v s t s1. All right, this is a trace. <coughs> so when I insert this guy at the end, uh, uh, w end, or to the so also trace right trace is also sum over basis <coughs> so I get this <coughs> so basically now uh, <coughs> uh, I can write now the full spectral form factor basically as a product of two such two such sums variables over one sum I define as as s's variables of the other sum so now this is like this comes from trace 
of u to the t. This comes from trace of u to the minus t. Variables are primed. Okay. <clears throat> and now what I get, now let's pick up all the phases together. So now this is e to the minus i theta s1 plus theta s t minus theta s1 prime minus theta s t prime, okay? So it's the sum of easing energies or phases with respect to time evolution forward and then minus the sum with respect to another time evolution backward. <clears throat> and then there is the product of over time, over first over space index, then over time index. <clears throat> Let's call it tau, just get one t. This, these guys. So now there is first this product of matrix element for the forward evolution, which is now a product. And then each of them is again a product, right? So this product is over time. This internal product is over space. So it's product over space, product over time. And there is S. Now I have to introduce a notation. Uh, this is a time index SJ, and then the, uh, SJ is a, J is a space index, but then tau is a time index. <coughs> then as j tau plus one, right? Uh, okay, so let me just write it like tau as j tau plus one. I just put two indices, one on top. Um, as j is a, is, a, is a vector, and then comma tau is the component tau. As j comma tau plus one is a component tau plus one. No. I, I, I guess it's clear, right? I mean, it's a component is a j component of tau plus one. <coughs> And then there's a, the same thing for the, for the other ones, but the other ones are complex conjugate. So with the prime indices. <clears throat> okay, so now this is just a brutal, uh, brutal kind of expansion of the spectral form factor in terms of eigenbasis, linear computational basis, so parameters of the model. <clears throat> but now let's do, uh, of course, as we know, this thing doesn't really exist uh, if you don't do additional averaging. So now let's just introduce additional averaging. And as you see, I mean, as I will try to argue, I mean, this, this is like a, a random variables of the model. Now we, I will decide them to be just uh, uh, energies of the, the, of the diagonal part, of the time evolution operator. So I will just say, let's assume now that this phases theta s, this is assumption, right? This is theta s i i d. I mean, we could now spend, yeah, I, mean, I think I have to close the finish, soon finish, but we could now spend a few minutes just discussing why this should be the case. I mean, let's now just assume that this is the case and maybe discuss for the break or for the reasons. Uh, but now assuming that I can do that, I can just take this first factor. Um, and I assume that these thetas, these thetas are IID random. Now, if, you know, these are like two to the n random parameters, this is the case. So this means this will be equivalent to say that now I consider all the terms in this, I mean, I can now expand this binary function to all possible you know, products. And I, will, and I will again get just exactly two to the n parameters. If I consider these parameters to be random, then basically I can mim mimic this, this random, uh, this random, uh, uh, random phases in this. <clears throat> so I'm, what I'm including next, I mean, if these are really random numbers, uh, then this, you know, this expectation value, I mean, uh, could be non-zero only if these two phases, these indices, the, the collection of these indices is the same as the collection of these indices, unless any of these indices is repeating, right? So basically, but this we will do later. So now, this, so from this assumption, what it follows is that I'm here. Tau. <coughs> Prime tau. This is a delta which asks that this sequence be the same as this sequence. <laughs> so the order sequence. What I mean by this is that you know I consider this as a as a as a 
It's an ordered sequence, yeah? Lexico let's say, in some sense, lexicographically ordered sequence, yeah? So, <coughs> which means that if, if none of these multi-indices would be repeating up to time tau, then this means that, uh, that the set of these multi-indices is a permutation of the set of these multi-indices. But if some of them would be repeating, then you know, one has to consider subgroup of multi -indices. So now, assuming that for times, for times, okay, I, time is t now. Now, <clears throat> time is running up to, now it's a running index, but running. Tau runs from. So now this is the, this is the key assumption, right? Now in sort of dynamic resistance, you would expect that this is true with this up to some sort of fluctuations. So if, you know, for give, given dynamic systems, you don't average enough, because you cannot, or you don't want to, then, you know, these uh, averages, where you only average over some parameters, will not be exactly delta, but will be delta plus some fluctuation. These fluctuations will give you some corrections to this, what we call random phase. As you will see tomorrow, these corrections are extremely small for the model that I, that I, that I wrote down there, <coughs> in particular in the region where alpha is between. <coughs> okay, so now, <coughs> I will now probably try to close. So, uh, um, <clears throat> so we will finish this calculation tomorrow. But uh, as you see, I mean, once you get this, uh, <clears throat> once you assume this, I mean, of course, this double kind of multiple sum is kind of easy to uh, drastically simplify because now this, I will assume now that <clears throat> uh, these primed indices, prime spin configurations are just permutations of the unprimed ones. Right, <clears throat> which means that this will be just a sum over the one set of configurations times uh, sum over permutation group, and uh, then we could identify. We will be able to identify the sort of leading contributions from this sum, and well, <clears throat> these contributions will turn out to be quite simple. So maybe I stop here and take questions. <laughs> Several minutes. Do you have any comment or questions? I have a question about this um, long-range uh, Ising model. I mean, you would think that your energy should be extensive. And therefore, you know, if you sort of do this mean field type of interactions, I mean, you have to somehow decorate this with appropriate powers of uh, 1 over n or 1 over square root of n, depending on what you do. Yeah. I mean, this somehow you do implicitly at the end, you know, when you make this assumption or, or uh, you put it in already. Why don't you put it in explicitly already? I mean, so I did that. No, I mean, we put this normalization such that this energy is extensive. Ah, okay, okay, okay. There's this cut ah, normalization. Okay, so this is how it's Okay, okay. That just makes the, they are picked in such a way that that yeah, is yeah. extensive. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Right. You see. Um, I got very used to this um, to this program of investigating um, spectral statistics of uh, of quantum models at very small scales, right? At scales basically of the nearest levels, even, right? And so there is this whole. I mean, you, you must know these words where they prove that Wigner matrices behave as just as GOE on on that scale, and so on and so on. Your approach focuses on a completely different regime, right? Because you 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 exactly look at scales of basically order one on the circle, right? So is it, what, are, what is the evidence that these two ways of looking for quantum chaos that they are a bit equivalent or, or should I not look for that? Or? Well, you should look for that, but uh, the moment, uh, as you're totally right, I mean, um, <clears throat> this type of analysis will now basically give you most precise information for times which are of the order of two, uh, one, 10, 50, yeah? not two to the L, yeah? Your level repulsion is at times, few times less than two to the L. Yeah? Here we are time of times, few times T. So, I mean, this is directly related to the spectral rigidity, yeah? Which is also a characteristic of spectral fluctuations. So uh, random spectra, I mean, random matrix spectra are extremely rigid, uh, meaning that if you look at the compressibility or uh, M fluctuations of number of levels in the interval of size N, this, num this fluctuation is not proportional to root n, as for Poisson levels, but to the log n. And that is direct consequence of the fact that spectral form factor is not two to the L, but it's just one. 
at a very small time step. So I mean, there is a formula which translates spectral rigidity to spectral form factor. It's just one to I mean, kind of simple integral transformation. Uh, and it just maps this region to the spectral, to, I mean, to the spectral compressibility. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, no, spe uh, spectral level spacing is far away. I mean, spectral level, sp uh, I mean, if we had a method which would give a spectral form factor around this region, then we could discuss spectral fluctuations. I mean, spectral uh, level spacings, but we don't have. So the methods that I'm going to discuss in my lectures are basically giving you the linear ramp, yeah? Slope of the linear ramp, and the, the reason why you have linear ramp. I mean, they're just not there. You mean for this particular model? For this particular model, no. I mean, yeah, for this particular model, it's just, okay, first of all, there are two levels, right? This is, again, a model like, similar to random matrix theory, but much more structured, yeah? So that it describes, let's say, leasing models uh, better than random matrix theory. But it still is a model. So, I mean, in, within this model, I just assume this to be random parameters, right? But now if you ask me if I, this is, uh, really eigenvalues of these sequences, which are using eigenvalues, then, uh, yes, yes, it is, it is roughly the same, yes. It, it gives you the same quality of data. So if you do a moving time average, it's the same quality as if you, if, as if you average over parameter j and h here. And in both cases, it's very well captured by this model. Yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe, a, a, Time, but tomorrow I will just start by showing you. Uh, uh, is a long range interaction necessary for this calculation? Because I think that long range interaction comes into that assumption. So, uh, no, it's uh, naively it's not necessary. I mean, what is necessary is to, to generate some sort of pseudo random sequence. <clears throat> but now it turns out that with local interactions, you can't do this. Uh, it's not just not, you just don't generate in, in, enough super randomness. Because you need, you need to, of the order of, I mean, not exponentially many, because I mean, if you would need exponentially many random parameters, then even longer interaction would not be enough. You would need all to all interactions. It turns out that if you capture, if you want to capture short times, then, you know, this is random enough. Yeah. You mentioned it, but what I think I maybe missed it. So, for short times, is this quantity experimentally accessible? I mean, as some kind of, I mean, does it have signatures and measurable, say, spin correlations? And I cannot say more than I said already. I mean, uh, it's a return probability. It's a, it's a return probability. Yes, it's a return probability for a random state. It's like, a, you know, some people would call this Loschmidt echo. This. It's an average Loschmidt echo, if you want, with respect to. In that sense, it is probably measurable, yeah? Okay, yeah. That's just fully transform of R2. It's not very abstract, I mean. <clears throat> One question about non-self averaging point. In one particular system, in the proof of the BJS conjecture, you use, uh, they use uh, the same classical periodic orbit theory. They, how do they take account of non-self averaging? In my understanding, they don't think about the uh, averaging of a Hamiltonian. So they don't think. In one particular case, I don't, I don't think about how how do they treat about non self averaging. Yeah, no, I'm. They should they should implicitly uh, implicitly they should assume some averaging. Maybe some point may. Um, 
they take account of this in implicitly. Yeah, they should. But anyway, that's not not rigorous, as you know. So. Okay. But at least Hamiltonia is uh, fixed in this in that case. Yeah, no, but but it's known that for fixed Hamiltonian you don't get uh, meaningful results, so you have to do average. They have to be implicit somewhere. Hey, are there any questions? If not, let's thanks so much again. Thank you.